Father, we thank you. Father, we bless you. Father, we are grateful for your faithfulness, for your loving kindness and mercies over us. As we go into today's study, please breathe over your word. Let your word glorify your name. In Jesus' name we have prayed. Amen. Today we move to part three of our series on Let's Get It Right. The topic of our study today is the milk and the strong meat of God's word. Let's begin by looking at Hebrews chapter 5 verses 12 to 14 from KJV. It says, For when the time ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is just a baby. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. 
The New Living Translation of this verse 14 tells us that strong mates are for those who are mature, who through training have developed the skills to recognize the difference between right and wrong. It is very vitally important that we know the difference between right and wrong, especially at this end time season when there are all sorts of false teachings going around. One of the titles of our Lord Jesus Christ is teacher. And because of this, he taught a lot. And he wants we, his followers, to be very deep in our knowledge and the study of the word of God. That is why John chapter 5, verse 39, Jesus said, that we should search the scriptures, for in them we think we have eternal life, and they are they which testify of him. And also in John 8.32, the Lord Jesus said, we shall know the truth, and the truth shall set us free. Very regularly, we need to engage in advanced levels of Bible study. For like where we started from, Christians who do not study the word of God often can only handle the milk of the word, which are still very basic things, but they are not able to handle the strong meat and the bones of the word of God. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 12 and 13, we are asked that we should be comparing scriptures and this we shall do today, as at other days of our weekly Bible studies too. Yes, the Bible is generally called the Word of God. This is substantially right. But we need to make many things clearer. That is why 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15 tells us that we should study to show ourselves approved unto God, a workman that needed not to be ashamed, but is rightly dividing the word of truth. This exercise in rigorous study of the Bible becomes more important when we remember that Satan, our arch enemy, relies more on deception than on direct attacks in this day and age. He started deception in Genesis when he deceived Eve in Genesis uh, chapter 3, verses 4 and 5. And at our own time, we can also see 2 Corinthians eleven three, and also 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4. The Lord Jesus Christ warned us in Matthew 24, verse 24, that many of the elect that is, many of the children of God, they shall be deceived themselves because many false Christs shall arise, many false prophets shall arise. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 14, 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen, 14, Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light for the sole purpose of deceiving people. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 13, we see that evil men and seducers, they shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. And that's why in Matthew chapter 13, verse 19, Jesus Christ said that when we hear the word of God and we don't understand it, Satan comes and he takes it away. It is therefore important that we take the pains to understand the word of God that we are reading and that we are hearing so that Satan does not take it away from us. Praise the name of the Lord. Now, some of the things said by different characters in the Bible, like prophets and kings, were directly inspired by God. While some of the other things they said or did were not inspired by God. Some of those things 
were inspired by their own spirits and by their own personalities. That's why 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verses 32 to 33, tells us that the spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophet. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all churches of the saints. That is why, for example, we can see that both in the Bible and in our contemporary situation, different men of God responded differently to similar situations. And some of these men of God responded differently to similar situations at different times. Some of the men of God in the Bible and in the church today were indeed inspired by the devil on the things they said or the things they did. Let's just see a few examples of this. God said concerning David that David is a man after my own heart. But the same Bible specifically told us that the devil incited David in 2 Chronicles chapter 21 verses 1 to 3 to undertake a census of Israel. This same David also committed murder of an innocent man. And of course, I'm sure we all remember that Judas Iscariot was one of the apostles, one of the first apostles and disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. But he it was that the Bible tells us in Luke 2, 22 verse 3 and John 13, 27, that Satan entered into Judas and used him. A similar thing happened to Apostle Peter, that Jesus Christ had to tell Peter that get thee behind me, Satan, because Satan entered Peter and was using Peter, as he still uses some men of God today. In Matthew 16, 22 to 24, and then that's where the issue of Peter was recorded. Now, when we go to Romans chapter 7, verses 14 and 15 and 19, Apostle Paul tells us, that he, he wants to do what is right, but he discovers he is not doing what is right, and instead is doing that which he knows is wrong. And he sees himself doing wrong things many times against his inner desires. So, recognizing all these things, we must remember that even the respected men and women of God are, after all, still flesh and blood, and they can therefore make mistakes. James chapter 5 verse 17 tells us that Elijah was a human being just as we are. He was a man with like passions as we are. And in spite of all his anointing and his power, he was just a human being. We must therefore remember that the things said to us by men and women of God must still be filtered. We must still verify them. It doesn't matter how anointed the person is. They can make mistakes. It's only God and the Lord Jesus that are above mistake. Any human being whether man of God, woman of God, even me talking to you, I can make mistake. Whatever I tell you, please check from the word of God. Whatever your prophet or apostle or evangelist tells you, please verify from the word of God. In Acts chapter 17, <coughs> verses 11 and 12, we saw, let's just read it. It says, these were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind, and they searched the scriptures, whether these things were so. Therefore, many of them believed. 
also of honorable women, which were Greeks and of men, not a few. These are the so-called Berean Christians, and they were doing exactly what we are discussing today. Whatever they had the apostles tell them, they will go and check, because the apostles can make mistakes. If the Berean Christians did it at that time, there is even a greater need for you and I today to do so. Before we close today, there is a major issue that we need to highlight. This is the habit of many Christians engaging in what is called biblical cherry picking. Cherry picking is defined as the action or practice of choosing and taking only the most beneficial or profitable items from what is available. Or put another way, many Christians pick certain things from the Bible that I like this one. And there are other things that are there that they don't want. That is what is called biblical cherry picking. The Bible, as we all know, has two major parts, the Old Testament and the New Testament. The two of them are different. The Old Testament is based on laws, on commandments, shedding the blood of animals to cover our sins, and it had a lot of curses, retaliation, vengeance, eye for an eye, and so on. God himself instituted the concept of an eye for an eye in Exodus 21. Let's see Exodus 21 verses 24 to 25, where God was talking to Moses. He said, eye for an eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burning for burning, wound for wound, stripe for stripe. Apart from this eye-for-an-eye eye concept, which allows people to retaliate, which allows people to take vengeance, which allows people to treat others the way they have taught us, God allowed it in the Old Testament. God himself commanded it, and he told Moses, and Moses told the children of Israel, and they were doing it. Now, apart from this, there were also many curses there. There were also what many Christians today call dangerous prayers, which we find in some chapters of the book of Psalms. In the Old Testament, all these things were allowed. God approved of them in the Old Testament. However, God himself decided to give us a New Testament. God decided to institute a New Testament. This time around, the New Testament is based on the shed blood of Jesus Christ. The blood of Jesus, as we know, was shed just once and for all, and it is in perfect remission of our sins. That is why in our churches today, we don't have to bring pigeons and bring bulls and bring uh, goats and rams to kill and shed the blood for forgiveness of our sins. All these have been done away with, with the Old Testament. The New Testament, according to Colossians chapter 2, verse 14, Colossians 2, 14, has nailed all these Old Testament things to the cross. He says, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailed them to the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is why we don't kill animals and shed their blood for our sins again in church, in the New Testament, as they were doing in the Old Testament. The Lord Jesus Christ as part of the New Testament, as part of the new demonstration of grace, of mercy that God brought 
under the New Testament. Jesus specifically canceled what God instituted in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, as we saw earlier, God said an eye for an eye. But let us see what the Lord Jesus Christ is saying in Matthew 5, verse 38 to 48. I'll just run through it. Matthew 5, it says, Ye have heard that it has been said, an eye for an eye, and a tooth for a tooth. But I say unto you, that ye resist not the devil, but whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, turn to him also your other cheek. And if a man will sue thee at the law, and take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. We can go on and on. By the time we get to verse 48, Jesus Christ said, And be ye perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. The New Testament is based on a higher requirement. It is based on love. It is based on tolerance. It is based on forgiveness. It is based on godliness. This was confirmed by Romans chapter 12, verse 14. Romans 12, 14, where it says, Bless them which persecute you. Bless and curse not. Therefore, Christians under the New Testament are not allowed to be cursing other people as they were allowed in the Old Testament. Christians in the New Testament are not allowed to be taking revenge or to be reciting those so-called dangerous prayers. I know many Christians do it, but we are not to do cherry picking. If you want to do Old Testament, go and be killing dogs and cows and cattle and be living under the law. If you want to live under the grace, the Lord Jesus Christ that taught us the perfect example, he said those things are not allowed. We should stop this cherry picking, trying to live under the grace and at the same time invoking curses that were under the law. Jesus Christ was also very specific about the aspect of calling down fire on our enemies like Elijah did in the Old Testament. During the Old Testament, God allowed Elijah. Elijah was saying, if I be man of God, let fire fall down. And God allowed it. Fire fell twice. On the third occasion, God didn't allow it. He had to tell him, okay, do this. Don't call fire down. But the Lord Jesus was very, very specific. Let's see what Jesus said. Let's look at Luke chapter 9, verses 51 to 56. Luke 9, 51 to 56. And it came to pass, when the time was come that Jesus should be received up, he steadily set his face to go to Jerusalem. And he sent messengers before his face. And they went and entered into a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him. And those people did not receive them because his face was as though he would go to Jerusalem. And when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said unto Jesus, Lord Jesus, would you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and to consume them, even as prophet Elijah did? But Jesus turned and rebuked them. And Jesus said, you know not what manner of spirit you are of. And verse 56, very important. For the Son of Man, that Jesus Christ, is not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. So, you and I that are born again Christians, that are children of God, we are not to destroy people's lives. We are not to pray death and fire over other people. That is Old Testament practice. It is not New Testament. Any Christian that is doing that is still operating under the law. You are not operating under the grace 
that was brought by the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus is our supreme example. That's why in Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, Hebrews 1, 1 and 2, the Bible tells us that God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in this last day spoken unto us by his Son, whom he has appointed here of all things, by whom also he made the world. So, Jesus is the mouthpiece of God under the New Testament. We have to accept, we have accepted his saving grace. We have accepted his blood. We must accept his word. Not just at being born again. Everything he said, we must accept it. Areas where he has cancelled certain aspects of the Old Testament, we must accept them as cancelled. And we shall stop cherry picking. Jesus is our new model. is our standard. He has told us what he wants us to do. And throughout the New Testament, Jesus never called fire on anyone. So we, his followers, we should stop calling fire on people. The only example where Jesus cursed was a fig tree that was unfruitful, but he never cursed any human being. And I pray that those who do it will stop doing it. In conclusion for, of today's study, Jeremiah 15, 16, Jeremiah 15, 16, it tells us, that thy words were found, and I did eat them, and thy word was unto me, the joy and rejoicing of my heart. For I am called by thy name, O Lord God of hosts. Let's continue to find the word of God and chew his word. Let's continue to live by his word. Of course, this was confirmed by Joshua 1.8. That says, this book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and thou shalt have good success. It's also confirmed also by Psalm 1, verses 1 to 3, which tells us that blessed is the man or the woman, the child of God, that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor seated in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in the word of God does he meditate day and night. And what will happen? Verse 3. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth fruits in due season, and his leaf also shall not wither and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. The devil continues to actively deceive many, both unbelievers and Christians alike. And as stated in 1 John chapter 4, verse 1, we are to test every spirit. Don't just take what anybody says. Go and check it. Check the Bible, compare scripture to scripture. And please like our current series says, let us continue to get it right. God will bless you. God will keep you. God will make his face shine upon you. He will be gracious unto you. He will lift up his countenance on you, and he will give you peace. We shall see again same time next week. God bless you. Bye-bye.